Hello everyone, my name is Maria Garcia de la Banda and I would like to start by saying thank you to Johan and Guyen for giving me the opportunity to give you this talk at Modref. And I will be talking about rethinking model reformulation from speed focus to human focus. And let me start with a disclaimer. The main goal of this talk for me is to make people think and to create discussion. It is not a technical talk or a review, it is a position talk. So it's based on my experiences in my research career. And if you don't agree with what I say, fantastic. Go to the chat, start a conversation. And if you do agree, fantastic. Go to the chat and start a conversation. And hopefully it will be short so that, you know, more time for discussion and for coffee or beer or whatever is your time zone. <laughs> okay, so three main themes in model reformulation as I see it. The, the first main theme, speed. Basically making a given model more efficient to solve. And one of the most common ways of going about it is analysis and transformation of either the model, so just the definition without the data, or the model plus the data that creates the instance. And as we know, there's lots of different ways of doing this. You can do it using symmetry breaking, so analyzing the model to extract the symmetries and then adding symmetry breaking constraints, I mean dominance breaking constraints. Uh, implied, useful implied constraints, combining constraints, adding variables, eliminating variables, all kinds of things. That's one way, analysis and transformation. Another way, very common, is taking the solver into account. So in this case, if you're talking about a MIP solver, then better linearizations. Or if you're talking about any solver, better the compositions if they don't have a global constraint, or certain codings, or many different uh, ways. And finally, so analysis transformation, solver, taking the search into account. So rather than having a, a no search or having a very simplistic search, well, transforming the model to give it access to complex built-in searches like large neighborhood search, like the impact search, or even, you know, portfolios, festis and that, whatever it is you fancy, helping uh, the modeler to model it uh, and execute it, the model uh, more efficiently. Okay, speed is the first. Second, lowering the bar or making it easier to create a model, right? So one of the popular ways of going about it is model or constraint acquisition, where you automate the creation of the model from the given solutions. Another possible way is adding high-level model constructs. So uh, increasing the expressibility of your model and language by adding you know, sets, multisets, strings, functions, quantify, there's a huge range of, of them in the different uh, modeling languages. And of course, these things need refinement, either through the refinement like Essence or, or compilation like Minisync, to um, um, transform the high level constructs into something that is gonna run uh, with speed. But the part that I'm talking about here is about increasing the expressivity of the model to make it easier to create the model. Fine. Okay, and the final is to add new modeling patterns so that uh, complex subproblems can be easily uh, encoded with a, a few lines, things like global constraint or support for other paradigms like um, product predict plus optimize or online, um, so real time uh, problem solving, etc. Okay, so we have seen two speed and lowering the bar. The third one is explanation because, as um, it says, just no is not enough. So explanations, uh, the, the two main kinds, first is explained failure, and that requires several steps. First, you need to identify the reasons for the failure, and there's uh, a lot of different um, interesting constraint subsets that have been created for this, from minimal unsatisfiable sets, minimal correction sets, etc. Once you have identified it, is how you report them to the user in a meaningful way, uh, in a way that doesn't overwhelm it, them and, and, and that it's, um, um, related to the model as opposed to the low level um, solver version. And also, finally, how to resolve them. So how to modify the particular variables, um, values of the variables, or the particular input data to actually get out of the, of the failure. So that's a more, more common form of explanation. A more difficult form of explanation is to explain success, particularly for an optimization, because how do you explain why something is good. It's difficult enough to say why is a solution, it's very difficult to say why is this better. 
Um, and it's easier, that's what is often done as a comparison. You compare the solution quality of, of two more hundred uh, different um, um, uh, solutions, or the most common one is to answer why not like this. And that's when you see a solution and you go, okay, well, I don't believe this is like that. How can I um, change it in this way? And that's why many times you go back to failure and then you go back to, you know, this part explaining the failure. And also a very good way of explaining success is provides diverse optimal solutions that then you compare, right? So all this, these things are very, very useful for explanation. Now, my plan point or claim is that of these three um, themes that are common, there's a decreasing amount of research in each theme. So speed gets the highest amount. And why? Well, I think is because it's the most measurable impact, quantifiable, and therefore the easiest to publish. If you can say, you know, I've done this change and look, now it goes much faster. Even if it doesn't go much faster always, if it goes much faster often enough or for particular kinds of methods, that's awesome. The next one is, um, but at the distance, is lowering the bar, but only for brand new ideas. It's very difficult actually to publish improvements because often you're told, hmm, not original enough, this has been done. Well, perhaps it has been done, but not as well or whatever much easier if it's for speed it could have been done before but if you can prove that there is you know five percent x number of percent improvement in speed but proving that you have lowered the bar x percent is very very difficult and therefore is much more difficult to publish not less useful but more difficult okay and then i think that there is very little not as much as it could be on explainability. Yes, I know it's uh, quite the term and quite hot lately, but it tends to be much more um, um, popular for things like deep learning, etc., where the explainability is considered to be really hard. For constraint programming, it doesn't seem for failure is a, is a different thing. Yes, for failure, there's quite a lot, but actually for success or, or for um, the more user center part of, of failure, is not that well studied. Um, and I believe that that's because demonstrate impact is even more difficult. You have to do user studies, you have to do lots of different things that are difficult to, to publish. And also tends to be problem dependent. It's much easier to show that it's impactful for a particular application, but of course, um, to, to be generic, that's a very difficult, it takes years to do this and then probably not published. Okay, and I think, well, that's, that's my belief. And I believe that this negatively affects real world applications because yes, speed is indeed important. But, and is the first thing that it gets noticed, right? So if it's bad, you're gonna get a no, no almost immediately. But a low bar is also important, why? Because it helps agile delivery of prototypes. It helps you to show that you, you know, this is what I can do, and then this is that, and you keep the attention and the interest of the of the industry that otherwise would have gone. Sorry, but you know, it took too long. And I actually found that in the real world applications that I work in, explainability is actually crucial. And why? Because as soon as the user starts using it often it gets unsatisfiable. And how do you explain why? And the immediate anger, not oh, more frustration that it comes from from the user's point when you do it and it's unsatisfiable, it's not easy to, to combat. Particularly when it's industry, and they're paying you and it's, uh, hmm, they are in a hurry. The second one is because when the user looks at the solution, chances are, and it has always happened to me, that the first thing that they say is, that's wrong. And it should be like this. And you go, well, mm. And the key then is to convince them that it's not, which is not easy. Or if it actually is wrong, which is probably at the beginning is, then you need to find why, and then you need to change the model to, to um, cater for that. And if you don't do this, the application is dead. Dead in the water. It, chances are that they, 
it's so difficult to build an application that is actually implemented as in as in actually used in the real world but if you don't pass this little hurdle then you're done and yet as i said very few papers out there perhaps very few accepted papers perhaps they were submitted but not accepted okay so i'm gonna now talk about why do i feel so passionate about this and it's because during the last few years i've been working on a very real um, world example called plant layer optimization uh, with a particular company now it's not just me there's lots of different people and actually these guys here, the, the ones that do all the, work, all the work. And you can see that there is two teams. There's a team on optimization and there's a team on visualization. I will see why this is so important. Okay, so what is the point of this um, application? Well, it is to be better quality plant layout designs. So to build the layout of the plant in less time. Now, building this, why is it important? Because it takes years and billions of dollars to, to build these things. And it uses right now a sequential process with quite old rules, engineering rules. And the results are very similar in layout to the past X number of years and of quite unknown quality. They're done kind of in a mold built on, on, on very traditional um, uh, rules. So the aim of this company was optimized equipment is optimized equipment position so you're trying to figure out what is the best place to put the, the, the equipment and how to connect all the pipes around it in such a way that minimizes the cost and by the cost so this is a, a kind of plan is the cost of all the pipes this you, you can see this enormous amounts of pines pipes the support so these things are supports to all these little bits and pieces and the footprint so try to compress as much as possible and also, of course, so to minimize this cost while satisfying some safety rules and some fact functionality rules. And of course, you want to do it in such a way that it results in a system that is reasonably fast and easy to use. That was at the beginning of the time, at the beginning when we were um, um, thinking about this project. That's how they plotted. Minimize and satisfy these rules, just fast and easy. That will do. Okay, so we started in... Well, it started actually in 2016, but the things actually got going in 2017 and they started with the optimal solution for a part of an existing plant. So they took out a small part and they told, told us, try with this. Very steep learning curve cool for us and for them. Um, we had to learn each other's language, etc. Um, high level modeling in Minising in this particular case, it helped a lot. It was incredibly helpful because it allows us to build prototypes quite quickly that they can have a look and and um, I gave our opinion. It was, um, the system was something like this. It composed of three main module, modules. One, there was all the optimization. So um, figuring out where to put um, the, the boxes, the orientation and the series coordinates. And then you will do a visualization of the, uh, of the solutions, this possible solution. And it actually built, uh, the visualization team built a collaborative 3D viewer that you could actually uh, collaborate across cities because we are across cities and you can modify, you know, you can rotate these things, you can change it and we will see it uh, in both sides. So you could see it over a web browser. And, you know, at the beginning, things were a bit slow and they were interested in the project, but they actually didn't believe in it. So um, they were not very interested. They were not constantly following up. They were like, oh yeah, if it goes well, great. If it doesn't, well, that's okay until they all the first solutions. When they started seeing things like this, then they suddenly want, hmm, okay, so this actually, hmm, that, that, that sounds reasonable, this can, this can actually work. So their interest grew and they wanted to try for a full plant as soon as possible. So it was suddenly, suddenly things got heated up and you know, hire more people, etc. So the next year, the entire focus was on scalability and usability. We want to make it scalable and more uh, easy, easier to use. So the first thing that they wanted is to enter the data because the, the plant grew up, so enter the data is tedious and error prone, so we had to build some process editor. And it was not just any process editor, we have to build one that they was familiar, so it looked something like this. Um, it had to be the one that they, you know, very similar to the one they knew. Okay, so that was the process editor. And suddenly scalability was indeed a problem because even with only 70, so we didn't take the full plant, we took a, a bigger part of the plant and it was 76 boxes and 85 pipes, which is pretty small. Now it's, I mean, normal plants are hundreds. 
no solution not not just not optimal solution no solution after 10 hours so we started using thankfully minizing is a lot is probably a solver independent and you can uh, try with a lot of different um, solvers so we try uh, lots of them and grobby end up winning we build some incrementality to get the first solution and we also built some large neighborhood search it took us a very long time trying different many 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 different things and finally we were getting near optimal solutions in a matter of a few hours and for much bigger plans than this one so suddenly by mid end of 2018 there was no problem it was all uh, speed was good and now suddenly we had a familiar input thanks to the process editor we had adequate speed and that's important adequate it was enough for them it was not lining fast but that was more than enough for them compared to years hey <laughs> they were super impressed and they had a visual solution that they can see and they can turn around and they can get inside and we will put it in in virtual reality so they got the full attention suddenly we had the full attention so in 2019 everything was about robustness and about user center so they wanted to apply it to a new real plant one that they were building at the time and for which they had had models and they wanted to compare and that's when the fun started and the fun as in fun because suddenly well it was kind of fun actually um we had lots of, as soon as they started looking at solutions like this you can see that the visualizations were improving um, we started getting lots of questions, not only about the solutions, but at the mo about the models. What constraints exactly? How do you handle this? How do you handle that? And what is it? Um, and they wanted lots of modifications to the model, to the input, to the output. No, we told you this, but now we wanted to, how about you try this? Um, now we want these things touching the outside. Not, And they wanted a lot of interactivity. They wanted to be able to take something and move it. They wanted to be able all these things and we started having very robust discussions about what was correct and what was not we started calling the you know the happiness factor of of, of these guys and saying how is your happiness factor today and it was really interesting to see how the rules in the model matched or didn't match what they were accustomed by tradition to see on a plant um yeah so this was happening but the real value the first time that they really, we could see the face changing was when um, they saw one solution that they thought it was wrong. And we managed to explain how, why the reasons underneath why it was definitely not wrong via a network diagram. It was not via this, it was via, uh, some, via something totally different that we had um, developed to for ourselves to understand it and he was looking at this that they figure out that there was a reason that they had never thought before in the traditional rules that made all the difference and that was what gave them new insight and proved better than what they had ever thought before suddenly suddenly they were completely interested by this year they are trying <laughs> we're applying to many different new plans new challenges now they want to wait uh, so the center of the weight, particular sizes of pipe, and they went the engineers to use it. So we did a training session, and this is not just an issue of, of software development. There's a lot of different challenges. So this year has been all about making the system more explainable, more interactive, and more versatile. And in general, that's, this just mean exploration. So now you can go from here, you can go to the section, you can select some of them, only apply for them, or some of them, go from the model, from the solution back to the model have a look at the pipes compare so speed no longer a concern that got completely resolved in 2018 the last two years has nothing to do with speed it's good enough that's suitable the other two are incredibly so um, lowering the bar and explainability are very important because they're vital for exploration and of course if it could be probably independent that would be great and we're definitely working on this one okay so that's my view of the three themes and the reasons why my view has been like this now let's have a different kind of lens which as you will see is is you know i'm very influenced by by, by them um is i'm talking about eugene's fred froda um 
uh, in pursuit of the Holy Grail. Um, and how it has evolved from the seminal paper in 1997 all the way to now, to 2020. So in 1997, what he um, um, proposed it, um, he pointed to many possibility, possible challenges. He talked about modeling, he talked about uh, interaction with the solving process, he talked about explanation, he talked about knowledge, so uh, exploiting it, and analysis in some sense, compilation, meta uncertainty, he talked about agents, negotiation, cooperation. He talked, of course, about evaluation, and that's something that we kind of have forgotten a bit. Which methods are best for which problems? Not based on statistics, but based on, so not, I'm not talking about uh, machine learning to figure out which methods are the best for which problems, but actually about understanding what in a model makes it more suitable for this uh, solving algorithm or not. But anyway, and the synthesis, analysis of, so that's the creation of, of, a, of a model from a, from a solutions and problems. Okay, that's in 1997. In 2007, his, so 10 years later, his um, view of his lens had changed a bit. Now we're talking about, so the Holy Grail Redux um, um, paper uh, focused on three main challenges. And you can see how uh, my view is, is very much influenced by that. He talked about acquisition, which of course is the, is the model, um, so acquiring a complete and correct representation for real problems, that's what I would call lowering the bar. And then he talked about automation, but he was really talking about automation of efficient and effective modeling and solving. So really he was talking about speed. And this, uh, the last one, so each of them was with acquisition, you go to automation, and then you go to the explanation for the success and failure, and then you start, right? So this is the, the, the general cycle. That was in 2017. In 2000, and, uh, sorry, in 2007. In 2017, he refined them, and as you can see, the changes has been, automation got, really, this was talking about solutions, so this was lowering the bar, speed, and explanation. So... But look at this, automating, automating, automating. So what something was automation in the middle suddenly become part of everyone and the other ones were more focused into acquiring the model, solving the model and explaining the model. But all through automation. And for me, that was the part that I was not, or that's the part I am not so sure about. Yes, automation is very important. But are we talking about automation? Are we talking about supporting? Um, because yes, automation is great, but should it be the end game? Not so sure. Um, making, for me, the end game is to make things easy. And by things, what I mean is modeling the problems correctly, solving them quickly enough, and explaining them properly. But when I talk about correctly and quickly and properly, what is it exactly that I mean? Well. That's problem dependent or really is user dependent. Only the user knows and what it means evolves from the beginning to the end or from one day to another one. And unfortunately, when you do automation, it sidelines users. It tends to sideline users, it tends to completely forget them. And here we go. That's um, classical for me is uh, MIP. The solver, um, the, the, you know, Gurovi solver, for example, has an amazing complex um, pre-solving, has very complex searches, and they're all automated, and you have no clue what's, what's happening. And some of them are awesome. Many of them are awesome. And often uh, the, the, the speed is great, but sometimes it completely surprises you, and if you just had some chance of manipulating, perhaps, perhaps, it could be before. Anyway, so... From my point of view, is it time to rethink? What are we really trying to achieve? And what is the user's end game, right? If we're trying to do applications for our users, what is it that is their end game? And then you go, well, uh, what, what user are you talking about? Because there are many, right? So there's the domain expert, which is just talking to the modeler, the traditional modeler, which is doing the conceptual model, then an actual decision model, which gets, <clears throat> data and that's the instance and then you have the one that uses this la 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 then you have the ceos and you know stakeholders i am mostly talking about this guy or a woman or man or whatever this person and um but also actually because the modeler is also a user and the domain expert and the model user often are the same <coughs> 
<laughs> Pardon me. Okay. So what I want is to bring, so automation is great, but let's bring the users back into the loop. Let's have an interactivity. Users are very valuable source of information and everyone knows that, but let's use the users. Let's not have automation that sidelines them. And often, unfortunately, the problem with the users is that very often they don't know what they want. They don't know what they need. So they have no idea what they need because they just have this very generic idea of what, you know, uh, the problem is going to be optimize the plan. Yes, but how exactly? And also, they don't know what they can have often because they lack the modeling and solving knowledge. They don't know the technical knowledge of what is possible in IT. So they really don't know what you could do for them. They have this vague idea, but sometimes they think that you can do everything. And sometimes they think that you can do very little. And the reality is somewhere in the middle. But interactivity allows them, so interacting with, and we'll see with what, helps them figure out if, you know, we present them with alternatives, if we allow them to select and modify between those alternatives, and if they can use, or we can use their information that they, they give us in the selections to modify the model, modify the data, and then you restart the process. You present them with more alternatives, they select, you use that, you improve alternatives, select, modify, etc. And you go, but wait a minute, <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, interact with what? What exactly are we trying to interact? Well, pretty much with everything. As long as it's useful to the users. Users should be able to easily, and that's another important word, interact with the speed to suit the needs. And what do I mean by that? I, I just don't mean just put a timeout. No, 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 no. Sometimes they want to use the cloud, but it's costly, so not always. Sometimes they need to use licenses, but not always because it's costly, etc., etc. So it's not the same to be at the beginning of the process, the middle of the process, the final version, etc. Sometimes they're going for a coffee, 10 minutes. Sometimes they're going home, that's, you know, 12 hours. And also they can very often provide very good guide. So guide to the analysis and transformations. Why completely sideline it? At least the modelers can guide this analysis and transformation, perhaps not the engineers of, for example, my plan layout. And the model, uh, they also want to interact with the model. And I'm not just talking about the input data, I'm talking about the model, right? So the kinds of constraints, the paradigms, and now I wanted to do it online, now I wanted to do it offline, now I want to do, modify my objective. And it's not just the weights. <coughs> And I have to drink. It's, it's, um, yeah, speed, the model, and finally the solutions. And not just the solutions, the non solutions. And you go, well, but if you don't have a solution, ah, but you can add slack variables and then look at something that does not uh, exactly, so relax the constraints and look at the result that is not exactly satisfying what you want, but it tells you how it's not satisfying it. You can also compare, modify, get explanations for them. You can interact with the models for them, and that is incredibly important. So you don't want the, the users often to modify the, the constraints themselves in the model, in MiniSync or whatever, but use the actual interface, the user interface or the visualizations to go and modify the model. And of course, something that we often forget, we want to modify, to interact with the rest of the application, often not constrained programming. We are not alone, right? So we have to, for us, we had to interact with the um, user interface through JSON, with the visualizer, also through JSON, etc. And of course, useful interactivity requires effective automated support. So automation is still there and it has to be effective, but from my point of view, to support the user. So we do need problem independent automated methods that what? That provide useful information to the users in a meaningful way, and then use the selections that the users make and the information that provides in an effective way to modify everything that needs to modify and also communicates well with other technologies. Unfortunately, Doing this is difficult. It's difficult to design, develop, and evaluate these systems. It requires a lot of time and extensive modeling language support, and it's not easy to publish. Uh, you know, after all this time, think about um, very complex systems like um, 
G-code. Um, on paper, well, actually, not even one paper, I believe. Um, but then, when you actually make them available and it's really, they're re so useful, everyone uses it. So, it requires time, but they're worth it. And, without it, there is no exploration, right? If you do not provide these things, this interactivity, the user cannot explore the solutions, the non-solutions, the model, the alternatives. And this is, I believe, crucial for a successful application and gives CP a competitive advantage. This is the one thing, well, one of the f many things that we do. I was going to say few, but I'm going to say many. One of the many things that CP does very well. Okay, conclusions. That's the end. My conclusions are the points that I want to make. Speed is important, but so is modeling and explanation. And we need more research there. Automation is great, but don't forget users and effectively supporting useful interaction is crucial. And this requires big changes in modern language and systems. Interaction, as I said, with solutions is crucial, but don't forget the non-solutions. <coughs> as I mentioned before, CP is great, but we're not alone. We're small part, usually in a big application. Don't be unnecessarily tough with reviewing. Make, you know, you have to be tough, the papers have to be high quality, but there's no need for everything to be absolutely perfect, the brand new, you know, to be new and theoretical and practical and have a good evaluation, everything at the same time. Give some credit what is actually valuable. And value research in non-speed focus areas is not just what is, uh, you know, quantitatively measured that is interesting or useful. There's many other things. And that's it. Thanks for listening and finished. More time for questions now. See you later. Bye.